Drivers ready! Engines ready! Go! Today's ancient DOS game is Whiplash, also known as Fatal Racing. And apologies if I don't sound myself as I'm still recovering from a cold. Anywho, this game is sort of the full embodiment of mid-90s racing all throughout, including the way the menus are done, the gameplay itself, the over-the-top announcer, not to mention the aesthetics of everything. Basically, it has no standout features on the surface and blends in with the vast majority of racing games of its time. But that isn't to say the game is bad, or far from it, but rather to say what makes this game interesting and unique lies deeper than its initial impressions will give you. Although it kind of surprises me how well this thing runs in DOSBox. I mean, even in its SVGA mode, the frame rate was pretty solid for the most part, although there were a few moments where it plummeted into single digits. Despite not looking like anything special, it certainly plays well, once you get past some initial hiccups, which I do plan to discuss. Plus, it has a decent variety of content as well. The only thing lacking was the contents of the box, which I'm going to blame on being pre-owned and opened in the past. After taking the slipcover off and opening the inner box, all that was inside was the manual, an envelope to send in the registration card, except there wasn't any registration card, and the jewel case with the game inside, tucked into a special cardboard insert. Okay, I guess it's not that lacking, really, and the manual absolutely helped figure this thing out, because again, some of what makes this game interesting is kind of hidden beneath the surface, and it'd be easy to miss if you didn't know where to look. Whiplash was originally developed by Gremlin Interactive and published through Interplay in 1996. It's a 1-16 player racing game making it one of the very few PC games of the 90s to support network connectivity with that many clients all at once. Plus it supports both VGA 320x200 graphics, as well as SVGA 640x400 graphics, both running in 256 colors, along with a variety of audio devices, though half of them only work for music and even then are unnecessary if you're playing with CD audio enabled. I do want to point out, and I didn't realize this when I was recording footage, that the graphics were intended to be viewed at a 1 to 1 pixel aspect, so if th things seem a little washed out, it's because I had to compensate for this after having DOSBox automatically compensate for a non 1 to 1 pixel aspect. So yeah, that kind of blurred everything a little, oh well. As for its current release date, it's still commercial and relatively easy to get a hold of, given that it has yet to see a digital release. Copies can be found easily on places like eBay, and tend to go for between $5 and $10 for loose copies, and closer to $30 fully boxed. Just be careful that you're getting the correct game. There's multiple games out there called Whiplash, and can end up confusing the results. Though, I suppose you could just look up Fatal Racing instead. As far as I know, apart from the name change, both games are virtually identical. Before you do any racing at all in this thing, you're absolutely going to want to configure your options and your controls. For starters, the default controls are kind of... weird. Okay, yeah, I get it that this was how it was in terms of British home micros, which commonly lacked any arrow keys, but I've never been able to get my brain to accept these kinds of controls as viable. However, it doesn't matter anyways. Plug in an analog joystick or gamepad and use it. This game plays a million times better with analog steering, and is virtually unplayable without it. So that's something to bear in mind if you do intend to play this for your first time, is make sure you got some analog controls going. You also have difficulty selections to choose from. <sighs> Really? Best I can tell, this primarily affects the top speeds of your opponents, as well as their aggression, as intentionally ramming vehicles is something you do in this game to slow your opponents down. But don't be fooled though, despite the many selections, this game is very challenging on all settings, for reasons we're going to get into soon. There's also three primary game modes, Single Race, Time Trials, and Championship. The Single Race just has you perform a single race on any track with any vehicle. Time Trials lets you test out a course solo. Well, Championship is all about completing all of the races and earning more points than your opponents. And this kind of leads into one of the first unusual aspects of the game in that you only have access to 8 tracks to start out with, and there's not really any in good indication that there's more than this. See, the way the game's lore has been built up is that there's 8 primary vehicle racing companies in the future. Auto Aerial, De Silva, Pulse, Global, Million Plus, Mission, Zizen, and Reese Wagon. 
When you go to select a vehicle, you select from those makes of vehicles, each with their own sets of stats, which have a major effect on the gameplay, so I highly recommend trying them all and going with the one that you like the most. But what can be confusing is that when you go to select a track, you again have those companies to choose from, and this is because each company themselves have made two tracks for these races. However, until you beat the first eight tracks in championship mode, the second set of eight tracks are locked off. And once unlocked, they're considered part of a Premier Cup over the normal Gremlin Cup. Thus, you swap between the two cups using the space bar when selecting tracks or other related things. Yeah, it can be kind of confusing, but it explains why half the content is seemingly missing when you first start playing. And quite frankly, it's nothing out of the ordinary in terms of mid-90s UI design. Once all your options are set, the race begins, and this actually plays pretty well. Although you'll notice your opponents rapidly get ahead of you at the start, and if there's a way to do a boost start, I wasn't able to figure it out, but it doesn't matter. These races are long. Despite the speeds you're going to be racing at and the size of the tracks, you'll often have many laps to survive in the process, when you're going to take multiple pit stops as well. And even though your total race time isn't shown anywhere, expect the races to last between like 5 or 6 minutes each. Actually, the timers shown up top are somewhat interesting. They only show up in specific camera modes, but they indicate how long your current lap is, how fast your best lap is, how many seconds ahead the next position is, and how many seconds behind the previous position is. All of which can help you gauge how well you're doing, if your overall position in the race wasn't a good enough indicator. Though you're going to notice pretty quickly that the various opponents often end up scattered everywhere. Now I've mentioned before how most racing games have some form of rubber banding going on to help keep the race balanced and enjoyable? Well, not here. As far as I can tell, Whiplash has zero rubber banding. This is both a blessing and a curse. The blessing is that if you get way into the lead, you can much more easily maintain that lead, or afford to do pit stops you normally wouldn't make to save time. Plus, as soon as you get in front of someone, they're not going to suddenly catch up and threaten your position unless you do something which causes your own speed to dwindle. The curse, however, is that mistakes are costly. If you're not maintaining the highest speeds you can at all times, it'll be nearly impossible to catch up to first place, and if you wreck out entirely, the time lost to recovering is going to be excessive. Unfortunately, your opponents are all subject to the same physics and rules that you are, and they're not perfect either. They can make mistakes which can cost them time in the same way. So being able to outpace the AI during difficult sections, like the stunts, can be a way to keep your position in a race even when the rest of your racing is only decent at best instead of perfect. There's also an announcer you're going to have to put up with for the entire race. Now, to be fair, this is probably one of the least offensive announcers I've heard in a while, but his dialogue really needed some fine-tuning and just more stuff to say in general, because repetition sets in almost immediately. Worse still, every time you do a corkscrew or loop-the-loop, -loop, he has these super long screams which get very grating. And unfortunately, there's no way to turn the announcer off without also turning off speech from your teammates, which is kind of important to hear. Oh yeah, it's one aspect of the game even veteran players may not be fully cognitive of. The championship races do come down to your own personal position, but the overall scoring of your team is tracked too. And by default, every team has two vehicles on the track. Your teammate will thus frequently get in touch with you to tell you what they're intending to do to help the team. The four potential outcomes is that they're going to do their best to rise to the positions, they're going to slow down to position themselves more strategically for attacking rivals, they're going to get aggressive and start actively attacking the opponents around them, or they're going to start blocking opponents from overtaking them. What makes this even more interesting is that you can use the F5 through F8 keys to instruct your teammate to do these things, although they'll frequently decline, so it's not that useful a feature. But knowing it's there can be helpful if you're at a point where it makes more sense to go for the team score rather than your own personal score. Actually, I should probably point out that the controls are very arcadey and have absolutely no semblance of realism. And this is kind of important, because if your car ends up spinning around, the physics will actually attempt to make it face the right way more readily, which can make adjusting from going the wrong way very unusual. For instance, if you end up spun around and facing a wall, just ramming into the wall constantly will eventually turn you the right way regardless of anything. You do have to watch your damage though. Once damage hits the yellow zone, you start to lose maximum speed pretty quickly. So chances are, you're going to want to hit the pits ASAP. And that's pretty much all there is to the basic gameplay, but this video ain't done yet. Your best lap yet! 
three laps remaining. It's been a long while since we've had one of these sections in a video, but while playing this, I figured out numerous tricks for success in this game, which you're gonna wanna take advantage of since the difficulty is way up there. The first of these tricks is quick pitting. The way pit stops work in this game is that you have to come to a complete stop before any pit work is done, and the pit work itself simply decreases your damage bar by chunks every half second-ish. Also, whenever you come to a complete stop, your engine turns off and needs to be restarted by holding the accelerator. With this info in mind, the best way to come to a stop quickly in the pits is to hold the brakes while slamming into the sidewalls, and then when there's just two damage chunks left on your damage gauge during the repairs, hit the accelerator, as it takes a second to start the car back up, and in that second, the remaining two chunks should get healed up. And this only shaves a couple seconds off of your pit stops, but you're gonna need every second you can muster to survive these races. Next, let's talk vehicle selection. I already mentioned that you're gonna wanna go through all of the vehicles in order to figure out which one suits you the best, and this is because there's some major control differences between them with certain vehicles designed for drifting, certain vehicles designed for high grip, and some are in the middle of those two and are kind of able to do both. To perform a drift in a vehicle that can handle it, all you need to do is just turn sharply for a period of time. Cars which drift easily are going to start to drift immediately, while others take a moment before they start drifting. There is absolutely no advantage to having a drifting vehicle over a high grip vehicle or vice versa, that's why it's important to go with what feels the most natural for you. And lastly, let's talk stunts. While several of the tracks offer up various stunts to perform, there's three in particular that you're going to need to be extra careful of. Loop-de-loops, corkscrews, and screw jumps. Loop-de-loops are probably the easiest of those three to deal with, but you'll notice when using an external camera that the camera flips partway through the loop and then flips back. When this happens, it's going to feel like your controls are inverted, so you absolutely need to be careful about that. Corkscrews are way different in this game than they are in the game Stunts, aka X40 Sports Driving. That game had corkscrews which rotated around a cylinder. The corkscrews here rotate around the center of the road, which means in theory if you shoot straight down the middle, you would do a full 360 degree lateral spin very quickly, and would also fall straight off the track. The way the corkscrews work in this game, you need to avoid spinning laterally too fast, otherwise you lose your grip and fall off. So it's actually better to stay near the edges, but not too close, otherwise you drive right off the edge entirely. It's best to aim to stay on the road as close to the edge as you can without going onto the median, and that should get you through the screw corkscrews pretty well. And lastly, we have the screw jumps. These jumps are designed to not only launch the vehicle, but spin it laterally in the process. Now, this would be absolutely insane to land properly every time if there were any variations to them. But thankfully, every screw jump on every track is set up identically. So long as you hit the jump straight at around 300 kph, you'll be fine. You have about 20 kph of play in either direction, though you'll risk more damage when you land. You go any faster or slower, and you're liable to land on your hood, and it'll have to wait a painful length of time for the reset to happen, since it won't happen until you come to a complete stop. Now for those of you racing an MPH, aim for 186, and try to be at least between 174 and 198. The speed at the time of the jump is all that matters, though, so feel free to wait until the last second to hit the brakes. Overall, Whiplash is a fun, above-average racing game that is permeating mid-90s all throughout. If that sounds like your jam, then definitely give this game a try. Or, if you've always wanted to try a racing game that plays 100% fair with zero rubber banding, yet still manages to be fun in the process, and yeah, this is a game that fills that niche. And yes, it's as absolutely as difficult as that sounds. And the game's not for everyone, though, and given the length of each race, you really do need to be into racing games in general to have any chance of enjoying this one. Just leave Cycle set to auto and you should be good to go. Except again, this game plays numerous times better with an analog joystick or gamepad due to how the steering works, and when using a joystick with this game in DOSBox, you need to make sure to disable timed intervals, otherwise the axes aren't going to be recognized properly. I tried assigning axial controls to the accelerator and brakes as well, but discovered that even though you can do that, they're still treated as digital inputs instead of analog. So you can only get analog motion out of the steering, not the rest of it. Anywho, that's all for this episode of Ancient DOS Games. 
Because I was sick for a week, I decided to shift everything ahead a week. So, starting right now and for the remainder of Season 5, ADG videos will be on the 2nd through 4th Saturdays of every month. Thus, the next episode, episode 243, will be on Saturday, July 28th. And we're going to be taking a look at the Shareware sequel to a freeware game. Now, there's a few games this could be, so you're just going to have to take a stab at it when you send in your guests to ADG at Pixelships.com. And make sure to stay tuned because, amazingly, for the longest time, I never even knew this game had a sequel. Thanks for watching, everyone, and special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small sample of you guys.